The Egyptian God Cards are cards that every person on the planet grew up looking at and saying that they were the most broken and powerful cards ever made. We all saw the show. We saw the God Cards wreak havoc every time they were on the field. And we wanted them. It's gotten to the point where God Cards are a specific tag you can use on eBay to list them easier. Konami also knows this, hence why they repeat the idea of God Cards every time they're available. We have the Sacred Beasts, the Wicked Gods, the Nordic Gods, the Mech Lords to a degree. And even further than that, Konami makes specific cards to help with the God's summons, like Ra's Disciple, and if you actually get them out, Mound of the Bound Creator. What do they all have in common? They were cards that people would fear in the anime that no one uses competitively. You'll never see Ra Turbo Top a YCS, and that's simply because it's a lot of work for minimal payoff. And that's good in a sense. What strikes awe and shock into the anime characters would only make for a gigantic salt farm if they were ported over into the TCG verbatim. And that's what I want to talk about today. Making Slifer the Sky Dragon, Obelisk the Tormentor, and the Winged Dragon of Ra more like Apocliff or Towers and less like Neos Wiseman in terms of boss monsters. There are timestamps in the description if you want to skip around and show your friends exactly what each Egyptian god card does, as that's mostly the point of this video. All of these cards would be run competitively if they were ported over directly, and I will stand by that. If towers can see play, these can see play considering they have none of the downsides of towers. Yes, the Egyptian gods make towers look like it has inherent downsides. Let's get into them. So for those of you who have never seen the original series, or you just haven't seen it in a bunch of years and you don't want to watch the entire Battle City arc where they were introduced, here's the setup. Pegasus, the guy who made the game, found the trio in his vacation to Egypt where a weird Egyptian man pimped out his eye and showed him the full extent of these three titans, to which Pegasus logically went back home and made the trio an actual card form, where everyone involved got attacked by the spirits of the cards. Because of this, he had to make them himself because the Millennium Eye gave him authority in these matters. Don't worry about it. After getting nightmares about the gods, Pegasus was told of how he pissed them off, so he made only one of each of them and gave them to Ishizu to bury the prototypes while he went on to make the card game because any other copies would have made the gods even more disgruntled and caused those who played them to get hurt or even die. We'll get to that. Merrick, the brother of the protector Ishizu, soon enters the scene as he takes Slifer and Ra for his own plan of world domination, but Ishizu protects Obelisk as she gives it to Kaiba for safekeeping. All the while, Yugi, coincidentally, duels Strings, one of Merrick's many strong rare hunters, for ownership of Slifer, and thus begins the big tournament for the gods where we see epic moments after epic moments, gods clashing against gods. The first time we see one of the gods is in the aforementioned duel with Strings, where Yami abuses Slifer's effect to make his opponent deck out and win himself the Mighty Dragon. After this, Slifer is used in the duel of Yami Yugi vs. Yami Bakura, and Slifer is just enough to take Bakura out of the tournament, where he is later destroyed by Merrick's Winged Dragon of Ra in an unsanctioned duel. Merrick entraps Mai in the Shadow Realm through blatant cheating we'll cover later involving specifics of Ra's summoning condition, and then Kaiba defeats Fate, sacrifices his own god Obelisk to defeat Ishizu, taking us to the Battle City semifinals. If you're thinking about when Odeon summoned Ra, it didn't work because he was struck by lightning and put into a coma, since that was actually a proxy, and the gods aren't a fan of being made proxies of. Yugi and Kaiba go back and forth for four episodes, making their god cards do most of the work, with Yugi taking the victory, of course, and Joey falls to Merrick in the most infuriating way possible, watch my Top 10 Yu-Gi-Oh! Duels video for extended reasoning as to why, and it's all thanks to Merrick pulling out more ridiculous effects on what Ra is supposed to do and changing the rules constantly. Slifer, Obelisk, and Ra all make an appearance in the finals, when Merrick is finally taken down one duel too late, and gives ownership of the final and most powerful Egyptian god to attempt. So that's what they did, and how they were used. At least until later seasons decide to bring them up incredibly sparingly. But what do they actually do? Are they as good as the anime hyped them up to be? Absolutely. And I may even go out on a limb and say that they didn't do enough to show how fearsome these cards are.
Before we get to comparing what all the gods do, it would be wise to say what they are in the actual real-life trading card game. Slypher, the clear weakest of the Egyptian gods in the anime and the trading card game, will be where we start, going up in strength from there. In real life, Slypher reads as such. Requires three tributes to normal summon, cannot be normal set. This card's normal summon cannot be negated. When normal summoned, cards and effects cannot be activated. Once per turn during the end phase, if this card was special summoned, send it to the graveyard. Gains 1000 attack and defense for each card in your hand. If monsters is normal or special summoned to your opponent's side of the field in attack position, that monsters loses 2000 attack. Then, if its attack has been reduced to zero as a result, destroy it. Not much to work with here all considering. Sure, your opponent can't do anything to stop it from being summoned, or bottomlessing it immediately after, but they can do anything from Mirror Force to Kaiju it once it's been there for longer than no time at all, so the protection is almost non-existent and might as well just say, Solemns aren't a problem, but everything else is. The effect is pretty good, locking down weak monsters from ever being summoned in attack mode without immediately dying, making small links and especially tokens that have to be summoned in attack position non-existent for your opponent which is pretty good for Master Rule 4 above all else. Before you see the real effect, before you see the real effect, just know that I have removed a few clauses from the proxies that every god shares, and I will still read them out loud even though they are not on the cards themselves. So keep that in mind. Here's the effect. Every time the opponent summons creature into the battlefield, the point of the player's card is cut by 2,000 points. X stands for the number of the player's cards in hand. Nah, no, I'm just kidding, that's the flavor text. Every single Egyptian god card has a terrible translation of its effect that's basically just used to interpolate in the anime, I guess? I don't know how you can use them, but I mean, they all sound like fake cards that you get out of a Chinese vending machine, so it's fun to look at at least. The real effect is as follows. Requires three tributes to normal summoner set. Your opponent cannot tribute this card. Control of this card cannot switch. Unaffected by spell and trap effects that would make this card leave the field unaffected by other monsters' effects, except for monsters with the same or higher Divine Hierarchy. When this card is targeted for an attack by a monster with lower Divine Hierarchy, you can negate that attack. Any equipped cards that target this card are destroyed immediately. If this card is special summoned from the graveyard, if summoned in face-up defense position when a monster your opponent controls declares an attack, you can switch the attack target to this card. Once per turn, during the end phase, if this card was special summoned, return this card to the location it was special summoned from. Other cards' effects are only applied on this card for one turn. This card has a Divine Hierarchy of 1. While face-up on the field, this card is also Dragon-type. This card gains 1000 attack and defense for each card in your hand. If a monster is summoned to your opponent's field, that monster's loses 2000 attack if it's in face-up attack position, but 2000 defense if it's in face-up defense position. Then if it's affected attack or defense equals to 0, destroy it. Okay, so everything I said about the real-life Slifer, I can take that back now. That is how you give protection. You can't kill it, you can't target it, you can't kaiju it, you can't steal it in any way, you can't shuffle it into the deck, you can't even equip something bad to it. Nothing. The clause that tells you it must be put back at the end of the turn when it's special summoned actually works quite well here, since it makes it not the dumbest card possible. It's up there, sure, but at least it gives your opponent existential dread whenever it leaves for the turn to more than likely just come back immediately after. The fact that it's a dragon is purely flavor, as there's not much to do with it since it's only on the field, so you can't just red MD it back or something. But it's something that's added on, I guess. The main issue we need to bring up is the idea of divine hierarchy, which is simple if weird. Basically, Slifer, Obelisk, and their wicked counterparts in Eraser and Dreadroot, for that matter, are only affected by their own monster effects and the monster effects of those with divine hierarchy higher than them. Those would be the Winged Dragon of Ra and the Wicked Avatar. This was all explained in Yu-Gi-Oh! R, but for the sake of brevity and not having blood spew out of every orifice for reading it, that's as far as I can say. Yes, that makes Ra objectively better than the other two when going god on god super fighting, but it's mostly irrelevant and can be read as unaffected by monster effects 99% of the time. Also keep in mind that those are the only six cards with divine hierarchy, the rest you can just kind of extrapolate I guess. I mean, technically you could say the Nordic Gods have Divine Hierarchy, but that's not on their effect, so we can't really count it. Aside from that, Slifer is made to be big and make sure your opponent can't summon monsters without them straight up dying. Strong monsters are a given out, yes, but most cards in the game rely on little stinkers to summon them. 
You think Orcus do anything when you just kill every single playmaker they have going into their Lincoln Xyz? It doesn't kill Rusty Bardiche, but it does kill everything else coming up to it. Even if the monsters don't die, they're still given a significant stat downgrade, and that's usually enough if your opponent could get to the point of summoning them in the first place. For the weakest god, you can still combo your way into summoning him pretty easily, and unlike the real-life version, you almost just win the game outright upon doing so. Next up is Obelisk the Tormentor, the god card that defines Kaiba almost as much as his precious blue eyes white dragon. In real life, it actually saw some rogue teetering on meme levels of play when it first came out, because you could give it protection through Hardened Armed Dragon, making it a bit less killable, but still susceptible to really big numbers and Tiaramisu, because that effect will never be power creeped, I guess. It's like Evil Swarms. When Evil Swarms can counter Dragon Rulers and stand a chance, you know they'll be considered forever. In real life, Obelisk has the following effect. Requires three tributes to normal summon cannot be normal set. This card's normal summon cannot be negated. When normal summoned cards and effects cannot be activated, cannot be targeted by spells, traps, or card effects. Once per turn during the end phase of this card with special summon, send it to the graveyard. You can tribute two monsters, destroy all monsters your opponent controls. This card cannot declare an attack the turn this effect is activated. Raigekion Legs has never been bad per se, but demanding more of a neg after already tributing three monsters is a bit of a stretch for most decks especially considering Beast King Barbaros was already a thing that you could just use to destroy everything on your opponent's side of the field. Granted, it's only once, but you can also normal summon it normally, so it's a lot more versatile. It can't even attack afterwards, which is sucky, but at least it does something on the turn you play it, unlike the very defensive Slifer. With Hardened Arm Dragon, it can't be targeted or destroyed, so your best outs are Tiaramisu and Kaijus, because Kaijus fix everything, right? Well, not the anime version. And just for consistency, let's look at the flavor text first. The player shall sacrifice two bodies to Obelisk the Tormentor. The opponent shall be damaged. And the opponent's monsters on the field shall be destroyed. I assume that the first line means you can only tribute monsters with physical forms, possibly humanoid, definitely not ghost tricks. And the second one is up for debate. Whether that's life points or Obelisk allows you to physically assault your opponent is beyond me and the PSCT. Also, I love the word shall in there as well. Obelisk decrees that henceforth the opponent's monsters shall be no more under the glorious land of Latveria. Obelisk does what he wants, and no one but he controls his being. To cut the crap, we can actually get into the real anime effect. I'm gonna go a little fast over the things that every god shares. Requires three tributes to normal summoner set. Your opponent cannot tribute this card. Control of this card cannot switch. Unaffected by spells or trap effects, that would make this card leave the field. Unaffected by other monsters effect, except by monsters with the same or higher divine hierarchy. When this card is targeted for an attack by a monster with lower divine hierarchy, you can negate that attack. Any equipped cards that target this card are destroyed immediately. If this card is special summoned from the graveyard, if special summoned in face of defense position, when a monster your opponent controls declares an attack, you can switch the attack target to this card. Once returned during the end phase of this card is special summoned, return it to the location it was special summoned from. Other cards' effects are only applied on this card for one turn. This card has a divine hierarchy of one. During the battle phase, if this card is in attack position, quick effect, you can tribute two other monsters, this card's attack becomes infinite until the end of the next damage step this card battles. Also after that, this card declares an attack. You can tribute two other monsters, quick effect, inflict damage equal to the attack of this card to your opponent, and destroy all monsters your opponent controls. Yeah, Obelisk could smack you in the face a turn after killing the board before, but now you can burn the opponent for 4k in the process and still attack afterwards, making a clean 8k whenever you get two other monsters out. Or alternatively, you could use this other effect to make his attack infinite and hit your opponent with the force of a million suns collapsing in on themselves. This is a good time to bring up that Call of the Haunted is deadly with all of these gods, but Obelisk in particular, when you revive him, change the attack target to him, and then tribute two tokens or whatever is on the field to just win the game outright or burn the opponent if you're feeling less cool. He's also the only god with attack that doesn't change wildly based on your hand, what you tributed, your life points, or anything else like that. So he's good even without the other setup. He may just win off of being really big and choke slamming your opponent's monster and their life points into oblivion. Another card that might as well just say, you win the game, but with extra steps. Lastly, we have the best god in the TCG, and the least comprehensible one in the anime. The Winged Dragon of Ross straight up gained a new effect every single time he was summoned, 
so that should be a good indication of what is to come. It is at the top of my longest card text ever video, card on screen now, and for good reason. This thing has almost 400 words in it, as we forgot some in the first list and still gave it first place by over 150 words. Lord, bear with me on his effect when we get there. The real life one is different, as you can actually read it and comprehend it. Cannot be special summoned. Requires three tributes to normal summon. Cannot be normal set. This card's normal summon cannot be negated. When normal summoned, other cards and effects cannot be activated. When this card is normal summoned, you can pay life points so that you only have 100 left. This card gains attack and defense equal to the amount of life points paid. You can pay 1,000 life points, then target one monster on the field and destroy that target. Big beat stick, kind of protection sometimes. Can't be special summoned, which is actually pretty weird considering the other gods. And it has support in two other big boss monsters to bring it out being Phoenix Mode and the ball that makes Salamangrate sad. It's been given the most love by Konami in a huge way, and that's mainly because, fitting every effect this thing has, it needs to be split onto three different cards. In the Dumbo Flavor version, Ra reads as such. Ra shall take power from three sacrifices, but even if the offering is to Ra's liking, it shall only answer to the one who speaks the sacred words. When the means of resurrection are granted to it, Ra shall come forth from the earth, and those who face it in war shall be incinerated in flames. In an instant, Ra shall become a phoenix, and the enemies of Ra shall return to the earth. So this brings up something I can't put into problem-solving card text in any way, so here it is. You have to say the chant to actually get Ra to come onto your board and not be a useless ball that goes to the first person to say the chant. The chant goes like this. Great beast of the sky, please hear my cry. Transform thyself from orb of light and bring me victory in this fight. Envelop the desert with your glow and cast your rage upon my foe. Unlock your powers from deep within so that together we may win. Appear in this shadow game as I call out your name, the Wing Dragon of Ra. That's the one people know, yes, but Yami also has one that he says to sound less evil. Almighty protector of the sun and sky, I beg of thee, please heed my cry. Transform thyself from orb of light and bring me victory in this fight. I beseech this humble game, but first I shall call out thy name. Wing Dragon of the Behold the third Egyptian god! Now what's Yugi gonna do? Choose whichever one you want, I guess. The second one is actually metered correctly on the last line, which kind of makes me mad for the Merit version, but whatever. The rest of it is incomprehensible, which won't change with his actual effect. This card's base divine hierarchy is two. Requires three tributes to normal summoner set. Your opponent cannot tribute this card. Control of this card cannot switch. Unaffected by smaller trap effects that would make this card leave the field and other monsters effects, except for monsters with the same or higher divine hierarchy. This card cannot be destroyed with a monster with lower divine hierarchy. Also, the controller of this card takes no battle damage from that battle. That's a different thing from the rest of the gods. Any equipped cards that target this card are destroyed immediately. If this card is special summoned from the graveyard, if summoned in face-up defense position when a monster your opponent controls declares an attack, you can switch the attack target to this card. If this card was special summoned, return it to the location it was special summoned from during the end phase. Other cards' effects are only applied on this card for one turn. This card's attack and defense become the total attack and defense of the monsters tributed for its tribute summon had on the field. This special summon card is unaffected by card effects that prevent it from attacking, also its attacks cannot be negated. If this card is special summoned from the graveyard, you can apply one of these effects. Effect 1. Pay life points that you have only one left. The card gains attack and defense equal to the amount of life points paid, also it is treated as a fusion monster, also it gains these effects. This card can attack all monsters your opponent controls once each, also, after that, it can attack directly if able. Any increase in life points is changed to increase this card's attack and defense. Quick effect, you can tribute any number of other monsters. This card gains original attack and defense equal to the total attack and defense of the tributed monsters had on the field. If Defusion targets this card, apply, that target loses its above effects and any effects that targeted this card now no longer targeted, also its attack and defense become zero, and if you do, its controller gains life points equal to the lost attack. Instead of return that target to the extra deck. The second effect is, this turn this card cannot be destroyed, and is unaffected by card effects that would make it leave the field. Also, you take no battle damage from battles involving it. 
If this card is able to attack, quick effect, you can pay a thousand life points, then target one other monster on the field, send it to the graveyard, ignoring card effects. Oh my literal god, why? Well, I know why, I just hate it. Merrick was featured in so many duels, and in literally every single duel, he added a new effect to Raw. We didn't even bring up on the card how you have to say the chant or else it gets stolen by your opponent who knows it. How do you even put that on a card? The only way I could get the proxies made for these things is when I took a huge number of clauses they all share off of them. In any case, I can't say anything about Raw aside from the fact that it is a Swiss army knife of different garbage you can kill the opponent with and stop any bad things from happening to you. Its second graveyard res effect is just pay a thousand, send a monster to the graveyard ignoring card effects, which is kinda neat, but I mean compare it to gaining 400,000 effects and being considered a fusion monster just because if you play defusion, technically since your life points are in it, you're fused with the monster, right? No, that's weird and dumb. Have you ever gotten sparks at one life point? Just defusion and get it all back. Who cares? The gods certainly don't. Run this one if you are to run any of the gods, as this is everything it's cracked up to be. In conclusion, the god cards are incredibly powerful monsters with abilities that supersede any and all doubt that they would be worth three tributes. I hope that this was a helpful guide and a good video to share with friends, and show off what these indomitable beasts are actually capable of. I'll be doing this for other well-known and anime-specific power cards like the Sacred Beasts in due time. So why don't you subscribe for that? I make other great Yu-Gi-Oh! anime content as well, mainly top 10s. Hope you all enjoyed. That was the extended explanation on what the Egyptian gods do and why they are some of the most fearsome cards ever designed in Yu-Gi-Oh! Was it good or was it bad? Did you like the time you had? Be sure to let me know in the comments below, and while you're there, make sure to leave a like on the video and subscribe to the JST Gato YouTube channel. I go live on Twitch sometimes, and I've been playing some Dual Transer. I'm actually liking it. We should be done with it in the next couple days of streaming. I also have a Patreon and a Discord, and all of these are linked in the description, so go on ahead and check those out really helps this channel grow and also help this straight up turn into a full-time job. We made it and I couldn't be happier. Living the dream is the goal here and you guys are making that not only possible, but an actual reality. Thank you all so much for sticking with me through all these videos and until next time, JC Gatto, out.